I've been thinking a lot about cozy games lately. There isn't really one single accepted definition of what makes a game cozy, but they're usually laid-back simulation games where there's low stakes and lots of freedom. They often have a cutesy or pixel art style, but not always. The coziness is less about the aesthetic of the game and more about what you do in the game. And what you do is not much. You farm, you collect trinkets, you talk to nice little NPCs. By their very nature, cozy games are inoffensive. But as I've been thinking about cozy games, I've realized that their coziness might be a lie. Now, I know that sounds dramatic, and I am really not here to ruin your favorite farming sim, I promise. But this video is just a short exploration of a few thoughts I had, so I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments as you listen along to the video. Alright, so most cozy games are simulation games at heart. And the goal of simulation games is to simulate some approximation of reality. But even the most realistic simulation games like Universe Sandbox or City Skylines make concessions on realism in the name of gameplay. As I covered in a video a while back about how realism is bad, actually, we probably wouldn't actually want our media to be perfectly realistic. So simulation games as a genre ride the line of realism in order to give us complex simulations of reality that we can and want to play with. They don't always try to perfectly recreate reality, but they do gamify it. But what about cozy simulation games? What is the coziness factor that sets them apart from other simulation games? To answer that question, let's take a look at the seminal cozy game, The Sims. The Sims is a wildly popular life simulation game where you create people called Sims and run their lives for them, building them homes, buying them stuff, telling them where to go and what to do. But for being a life simulation game, The Sims isn't all that realistic. Think about it. In these games, home ownership is the default, not the exception. No jobs require college degrees, but having a degree will always give you a head start on the career ladder. University is affordable. Medical bills are functionally non-existent. Everyone gets family leave after having a baby, and there's no such thing as a surprise pregnancy. No matter your sim's gender identity or sexual orientation, they can find a partner and even adopt children with no stigma or fear of being ostracized. There's no racism, no abuse, there's no concept of ugliness. No matter what your sim looks like, they can find love. Yes, your sims can get sick, they can get fired, their appliances can break, they can get abducted by aliens or squashed by a vending machine, but when looking at the larger structures and systems, the world of The Sims seems pretty great. It's set in a world that's like ours, but better in almost every way. And I think that this is the thread that connects cozy games as a genre. It's not art style, it's not pacing, it's not content. It's that cozy games are simulations that don't worry about reflecting how the world actually is. They reflect how the world ought to be. They're not realistic. They're idealistic. Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing, two other games that appear on every cozy game list, are simulation games. You are simulating the daily activities of your character, but not in a world that looks anything like ours. Yeah, you have to make money to pay off debt and buy plants and decorations and things, but you get to spend your days tending your crops and making friends with the sweetest NPCs ever created. In these games, like in The Sims, we are given perfect worlds. Worlds where we can be ourselves, where we don't have any real responsibilities, where we can build homes and talk to friends and do simple tasks and we don't have to worry about taxes or sickness. So what's the issue? The world of The Sims is decidedly egalitarian. It's a perfect meritocracy where hard work always pays off. There's no bigotry to speak of, no conflict outside of some petty crimes here and there. So let me ask you a question. In a world like this, why would they need a military? On December 7th, 2023, EA released their newest expansion for The Sims, The Sims 4 for Rent. This expansion pack introduced the ability to build rental units and rent them out, with your sim acting as a landlord. 
While many Sims players were excited to finally have the ability to build apartment buildings, something they had been asking for for years, this pack did seem antithetical to the purpose of The Sims games. The Sims gave us a world where everyone could afford to buy a home, a world that was like ours but better, and then they added landlords? This change wasn't as sudden as it seems, though. The Sims 4, and frankly the entire Sims series, has always struggled to balance realism versus idealism. They want players to be able to see themselves in the game and play in ways that better reflect their own lives and experiences. A lot of people live in apartment buildings, and it's great that they are now able to build places that look like their homes, after all. But when this realism is at odds with the game's otherwise idealistic gameplay, that's where the cracks start to show. For instance, there's been great strides in representation of different cultures and with LGBTQ representation, but there's also been massive controversy around the lack of representation of disabilities in the games. The world of The Sims is accepting of marginalized people, but only some of them? What are we supposed to assume about this world where we have the realism of landlords next to the idealism of being able to sell a rock you found in a mud puddle for the same price as a nice dinner? Or a world with the idealism of world peace next to the realism of a standing army? Once I started noticing some of these apparent inconsistencies, I couldn't stop. And what's worse is that it wasn't just about the inconsistency of these gameplay elements, it was about what they revealed about the system of the games. When you break them down into their parts, when you separate the realism and the idealism, cozy games are really just capitalism simulators. All of these games incentivize the accumulation of stuff. They include the concept of rent or debt, which you can only pay for through the buying and selling of stuff. They also include mechanics where you extract resources from the environment, sometimes by causing irreparable damage, and then use the resources you've harvested to craft more stuff. It all comes down to collecting stuff and making money, whether you call it simoleons or bells or gold or diamonds. These worlds may feel cozy, but it's worth questioning whether the systems they employ actually are. Is it cozy to have to constantly upgrade your Animal Crossing house because you've run out of room to store all your things? Things you don't really need, but you're worried you might want someday so you keep hoarding more and more and more? Is it cozy to distill down every sim, including yourself, into a simple collection of traits and skills? Skills which are quantifiable, discrete, and objective? Is it cozy to see every part of the world as a resource to be extracted? Is it cozy to indulge in all the worst habits of our deeply flawed world? Cozy simulation games present us with worlds that look like ours. They give us control over these worlds, and then they tell us we are free. But we're not. These games are built within our current framework of consumerism and efficiency, and because they are built within that framework, they cannot escape it. So even while our characters have perfect, simple lives unhindered by bigotry or the laws of physics, we are still expected to play the game of infinite growth. Is that cozy? It wasn't always supposed to be like this, though. The Sims series began life as a critique of consumerism. While working on the concept for the game, Sims game designer Will Wright lost his home and all of his belongings in the Oakland, California firestorm of 1991. This loss is part of what inspired The Sims' emphasis on accumulating stuff as a core gameplay loop. And this accumulation of stuff was actually explicitly designed to be a time suck. Getting more stuff looks like it's going to make your Sims' life easier, but ends up actually being a bad thing. The Sims was supposed to be a game that exposed the issues with our world, that made us think about why we felt the need to make more and more money to buy more and more stuff, and yet, 20 years later, that original intent is nowhere to be seen. Instead, the games are like what philosopher Louis Marine terms a degenerate utopia. Something that, from the outside, looks like a utopian version of society, but which actually just perpetuates the flaws of the society it's supposed to be critiquing. As writer Anne McGuire puts it, The Sims distills and intensifies key ideological aspects of late capitalism. 
Self, other, and time are all quantified and commodified. What the player is doing is shopping effectively in order to manage a life in the world. Only through successful acquisition and deployment of commodities can Sims' needs be met and moods kept elevated. And the successful player is a discerning consumer. A far cry from Will Wright's parody of consumerism. But I still like The Sims. I still like Animal Crossing and Minecraft and all of the other simulation games I've talked about. No, they don't do a good job of deconstructing consumerism or the myth of meritocracy, but maybe that's okay. Because it's not just about realism and idealism. There is a third variable we have to consider. Fun. One of my favorite YouTubers is Lil Simsy, who makes videos building houses and doing let's plays of her various Sims families on YouTube and Twitch. She is incredible, genuinely she's a ray of sunshine, but something she talks about a lot in her videos is that when you build houses in The Sims, you can't make them realistic. The more realistic they are, the more unusable they are. But being idealistic is an issue, too, sometimes. Lil Simsy actually likes to make her Sims struggle. She even has a particular Sim, Stanley Humphrey the Hot Dog Man, who she uses for rags to riches challenges and whose whole purpose in life is to struggle. I love this hot dog man. What makes The Sims and all simulation games fun isn't how realistic they are or how idealistic. Fun is independent of realism, and that's the beautiful thing about cozy games. Yes, they lie to us. They give us perfect versions of our world that are still deeply flawed. But that doesn't mean they're not worth playing. We're allowed to have fun with these games. And let's be honest, if they were perfect critiques of consumerism, they probably wouldn't be fun. I just think it's important to think about where that fun comes from. These games are fun not because consumerism itself is fun, but because the game worlds were built specifically to separate consumerism from its consequences. You can hoard money and stuff. You can create the most unethical farms and factories the world has ever seen. You can make more money than you could spend in a thousand lifetimes, and there are no downsides. And having direct feedback from the decisions you make is what makes these games feel so cozy, even while being nestled within that consumerist framework. When you know that raising a sim skill will allow them to make more money, when you know exactly how much your items are worth at Nook's Cranny, when you know that three iron ingots will always make one iron pickaxe and one iron pickaxe will always mine 251 blocks, the world feels safe. It's predictable. It's easy. It's cozy. The point of this video wasn't to ruin cozy games, but just to point out that the fantasy of cozy games is limited. And when we play these games, we should be aware of those limitations. I don't think The Sims should be a poverty simulator. I just think it would be better if it was brave enough to actually be honest about what causes poverty in the first place. The worlds of The Sims and Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley are nice, but Imagine what kinds of worlds we could play in if they weren't constrained by all those systems, by consumerism or the existence of money or bosses or landlords. What if we were actually free? If we had a real sandbox game to play around in? Imagine the utopias we could make. Perhaps the most unrealistic part of The Sims, though, is how talented they are. Sims can grind for an entire week subsisting only on grilled cheese to become a best-selling author in a matter of days. We aren't Sims, but we have something they don't. Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with a ton of classes on a huge range of topics, like film, illustration, design, self-care, and music, all led by industry professionals. 
One of my goals for 2024 is to do more fiction writing. And Skillshare does have a ton of great classes on writing, but what's been the most helpful for me is actually their learning path on creative productivity, which is essentially a whole series of classes about how to stop procrastinating and actually make the art you want to make. I felt like I had been in this like creative rut when it came to writing fiction, and it has actually really helped. Learning paths are hand curated groups of classes that all build sequentially off of each other. So if you're overwhelmed by just how many classes Skillshare has to offer, these learning paths are a great place to start and they come on a variety of topics. The new year is the perfect time to start a hobby, or finally go back to an old one. So if this sounds up your alley, then come check out Skillshare using my link in the description, where the first 500 people to use that link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Again, that link is in the description and in the pinned comment, so if you are interested in Skillshare, be sure to use that link. And thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring. Before I end the video, I just want to reiterate that this isn't meant to be a takedown of cozy games. I just wanted to explore some stuff I'd been thinking about over the past few weeks, and hopefully you found it interesting. The stuff I brought up isn't unique to cozy simulation games either, so if you did find this interesting, then I really recommend this video about animal welfare in Zoo Tycoon, and this other video about the car-centric assumptions baked into city skylines, which I found really, really interesting. Both of these are linked in the description, along with a video about the fake economies of Minecraft, which I love, and a whole playlist of Sims video essays that I built this one off of, like Bram de Groot's video, The Sims as Anti-Capitalist Critique, which I really recommend if you're looking for a more explicitly political angle. There's also a lot more that could be said about how city building and real-time strategy games have similar assumptions about resource extraction and how they simplify the way that global politics works, but that is something I'm going to leave as an exercise for the reader. This video was just a short little jaunt to ring in the new year, but don't worry, I have a big video coming next month talking about plagiarism and trust and academic integrity and how we decide who is worth listening to. I've been doing a ton of research for this one and it's gonna be pretty huge, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so you get notified when it comes out. As always, I want to give a huge thanks to my patrons, especially A Tasty Snack, Adam, Hugh Sophia, Justin Lowry, Megan Lowndes, and Shep Alderson. My dog Ren recently had a procedure done for a shoulder injury, and we wouldn't have been able to get her what she needed without my Patreon, so I am incredibly thankful for all of your support. Thank you all so, so much. But finally, today's Patreon poem of the video is Rack for Bookworm. I saw three dead penguins on the beach. They were round and stiff like old toys. Still bloated, gorged on a child's stories, fat with the fantasies spun under blankets in the middle of the night. She'll remember each of their names, long after the bodies are taken in the secret dark of the nighttime beach by ghosts made of salt and wind and claws, and returned to the sea. And until next time, stay safe. Stay warm, especially everyone going through all of the terrible winter storms these past weeks. And I'll see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. But, like, who elected Isabel? Like, it's a town hall, but is she in charge? Is she, like, the mayor? <laughs> who put her there? Who, are, are there elections? Also, who is funding Nook, Inc.? Why does Tom Nook like, own everything. Like, literally every thing that you interact with is owned by Tom Nook, and we're just supposed to accept that? Eat the Rich includes Tom Nook. <laughs>